Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks is a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. Our goal on these SALT Talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Wes Moore to SALT Talks. Uh, Wes Moore is the Chief Executive Officer of Robinhood, not the trading platform, Robinhood, the foundation. It's one of the largest anti-poverty forces uh, in the country. Wes's first book, The Other Wes Moore, is a perennial New York Times bestseller, and it captured the nation, nation's attention on the fine line between success and failure in our communities and in ourselves. He's also the author of the recent, recently released Five Days, as well as another uh, several books that are all great reads. Uh, Wes was a Rhodes Scholar. He graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Johns Hopkins University in 2001. Wes then served as a captain and a paratrooper in the U.S. Army's 82nd Airborne Division, including a combat deployment to Afghanistan. He later served as a White House fellow to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. And thank you, Wes, for condensing that bio because you've done so many great things that I could have gone on for about 10 minutes uh, before we got into the interview. But we appreciate you condensing it into a few of your biggest highlights. So thank you for that. And hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm. Anthony is also the chairman of SALT. And with no further ado, I will turn it over to Anthony for the interview. Well, John, thank you. Wes, th thank you for joining us. But I, I, if it's OK with you, I'd like to go a little bit more deeply into your background. Uh, there's something on Wikipedia that John couldn't find that you could share with us about how you grew up and what gave you this arc of a career, which I would describe as a call to service, both in the government and outside the government. Yeah, thank you. And uh, and again, you know, I just, I'm, I'm appreciative of, uh, of, of, of all the work uh, that you all and, and, and the entire audience just continue to do, I think, at a really complicated and a hard time, uh, you know, for our society. Uh, but, you know, I, I honestly feel like in many ways, uh, you know, I, I came to this honestly, where, you know, I, I come from a family of, of as you call it, preachers and teachers, of, of people who had a, a fascinating, um, at times heartbreaking and uneven journey uh, when it comes to and came to this country, but who also just had this undying belief in what this country could be. And, uh, and you know, I find myself actually leading an organization now uh, that is, you know, is 32 years old, but the irony is that uh, Robin Hood, the, the first neighborhood that Robin Hood actually invested in was one of the neighborhoods that I grew up in. Uh, because I only have two memories of, of my father when I was down in Maryland. And the second one was when he died in front of me when I was about four years old. And my mother had a really difficult time with the transition. You know, she now unexpectedly became a, a, a widow with three kids that she was gonna raise on her own. And this was not the life that she had prepared for or dreamt about or expected. And she was having a really difficult time with it. And finally, uh, she called up her parents, my grandparents who were living up in in, in New York, where my grandfather was a minister in the South Bronx, and my grandmother was a school teacher in the South Bronx for 25 years. And, you know, their house was barely big enough for them, but they figured out a way to make it big enough for all of us. But that neighborhood, that house, uh, was also one of the first places that the organization that I now lead, that I now run, uh, made investments in. And so in, in, uh, I almost think about there was almost a, a full circle uh, process of me bringing me to the seat that I'm in now. Um, I got to ask you this question, Wes, and, you know, forgive me for being this forward, but the loss of your dad, which I, I'm sorry for, um, tell us how that impacted you. Because, you know, I, I, I've mentored a lot of uh, kids from the 9-11 experience, and I am so proud of these kids. Do you think the loss of your dad uh, catapulted you in some ways? I'm sure it set you back in others, but tell us about that in terms of its impact on your life and your child? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's one of these things I've always thought to myself, it's, uh, it's amazing how you can love someone so much that you barely knew. Uh, and, and the reality is, is that I think that, um, you know, he and his presence, who he was as a person was incredibly 
informative um, and instructive in a way that I obviously did not appreciate, you know, while he was here, but in many ways it's guided me the entire way through. Um, but there is no doubt that it made life uh, immeasurably tougher on my mom, on others, uh, where that burden and that, frankly, that unexpected burden then gets placed on them. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because I remember having a conversation with, with the other Westmore. I wrote a book called The Other Westmore where I kind of chronicled the life of these two kids who were growing up in similar areas, similar times, et cetera, but just went different paths. He's now in, in, uh, in prison for a life sentence. And we talked about our fathers and how, you know, he has seen his father, met his father, I think three times in his life, in his life. And his father lived around the corner from him. And he knew the story of my father, how my father died in front of me when I was four. And he, he said to me, he said, you know, your father wasn't there because he couldn't be. My father wasn't there because he chose not to be. So we mourn their absence in different ways. But the thing that I think he also said that was true, and I believe that is no matter what that reason was for that hole, that hole is real. And that hole is, is sincere. And so I think that the, 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 the thing that I really grew from and learned from throughout that experience as well is, you know, I had a collection of people in my life who never, ever could replace my dad, never replace who he was and what he meant to me. And frankly, the fact that I still very much feel like he's still somewhere kind of clearing brush for me and helping me out in ways that I, 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 I don't even probably fully appreciate or understand right now, but he's, he's, he's up there still fighting for me. Um, but also the amount of people who understood that, that, uh, that none of those things, not being fatherless or where I was raised or anything like that, that should ever define me or limit me. And so in essence, what they really did was they taught me what it meant to be free. And that's what I'm just incredibly grateful for, for all the people who did step in, because in many ways they weren't trying to replace anybody or replace anything that wasn't there. But without realizing it, they were teaching me what it means to be free. Uh, and I'll be forever grateful for it. And listen, it's a beautiful story. And I appreciate you sharing that with us. And uh, um, I can feel the pathos of that story and, and the heartfelt nature of the story, which has probably driven you into Robin Hood's mission in some ways because of that healing personality that you have and you're attempting to work with other people uh, to heal their situations. Tell us about the mission of Robin Hood for people that don't know Robin Hood. Yeah, uh, Robin Hood is one of the nation's largest poverty fighting organizations. And then for, you know, for over 30 years, we have been finding, fueling, funding, creating when necessary, uh, the, the most impactful and scalable solutions to actually lift families out of poverty measurably and sustainably, where, you know, just, just last year alone, uh, you know, we uh, we partnered with over 600 organizations um, supported with support of food and housing, education, legal services, uh, workforce development. You know, one thing that we say is everywhere where poverty is either the cause or the consequence, uh, that's where we are and that's where we exist. And, you know, and I think Robin had also introduced a lot of really interesting elements into the way people think about philanthropy, almost this idea of venture philanthropy. Where, where, you know, venture philanthropy in many ways is, is how can we use data? How do we use information? How do we work with the community to be able to find the best solutions? And I, I think it was, it was really the usage of that data, the fact that we have a benefit to cost ratio uh, on every dollar that goes out. And that's important because we think that, you know, that the same way people approach the, their private life or the private sector, you should be able to add levels of, of, of understanding and data in terms of where you work and the things that you do. And it still to this day guides where Robinhood invests and how we put our capital. Um, and, at the same, and at the same time, uh, making sure that there will be no improvements. There will be no sustainable momentum, economic momentum in communities if you're not working with the members of the community. That anytime we think that we can just, uh, you know, just uh, give money or give checks and that type of thing, that, that even if it's done from a spirit or a place of, 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 of altruism, your altruism will be perceived as something else. 
if you're not truly willing to be engaged and involved with impacted communities and impacted community members. And so we really try to come up with a holistic way of, the, of how we think about philanthropy, whether it's management assistance, technical assistance, partnerships within the organizations within our portfolio, using data, leveraging policy. All of these are things that are crucial when it comes to what is the Robin Hood model and why has the Robin Hood model worked for, for over three decades. So I, I think that's fascinating. And I, and I want to ask this follow-up question because I, I've had this experience. I grew up in a blue collar family. My parents weren't educated. My dad was a crane operator, hourly worker. And that's a measure of success. And I find sometimes when you're in a altruistic position and you're trying to help people, there's a paradox to it in some ways because some people almost feel guilty that they're accepting your kindness or they're, they're accepting your charity. Have you experienced that? Uh, and if you have, how do you sort of get people past that, if you will? I, um, you know, I, I, I have been the, the recipient of where people are doing things and they think they're doing it just out of charity and that type of thing. And that's one of the reasons why I'm very clear with the organization that I run. Um, uh, we are not a charity. I don't believe in charity. I believe in change. Uh, I, I think charity oftentimes can come off as paternalistic uh, and offensive, and particularly to those recipients of it. Because I think that there has to be, there has to be a full understanding of not just how can that level of support support those who are the most in need in that moment, but there also needs to be a recognition of why that need is so pressing for the individuals who are in that situation. Uh, you know, when, you know, one of the reasons that I think we've really started to move and continue to move and leverage into understanding where public policy works, for example, is, you know, we have to be very clear that, that the reason that we have these massive gaps within our society, the reason that we have such an equity within our society is not because philanthropy has done its job. You know, it's not because the social service organizations aren't, aren't doing their work every day. It's because we have policies that are still very much in place that are putting people and keeping people in poverty, where we still have a legacy of une une uneven public policies at the local and the state and the federal levels. Um, and that are really leaving too many people who are just chronically impoverished and it's still making poverty incredibly predictable. And so I think the way that we really try to view it is that philanthropy um, alone can't solve the issues. And it's really why we really try to use the other levers within this to try to leverage it, because this idea of, 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 of charity um, that we'll put out are, are things that, particularly when you're talking about the impacted population and the recipients of it, uh, we have to understand that there has to be a difference between how we're dealing with the right now and how we're dealing with the everyday pain that people are facing and how are we dealing with the systems and structures that are that's making that pain so present and that's making that pain so permanent. Uh, and so really trying to take and flip that dynamic is, I think, an important component to that entire conversation. So, so if you had a list, the contributors then to the cycle of poverty, particularly in minority areas, what, what, what are they? Well, um, you know, one is, and it's a great question because, you know, I, I think about it kind of in the context and even when people will look at our portfolio, you know, where we invest and which areas we invest in. And people say, you know, is it education? Is it housing? Is it, uh, is it health? Is it uh, transportation or criminal justice reform, whatever? Uh, the honest answer when you look at the data is yes. That's exactly right. Um, because poverty has this way of showing itself in every way for those who are inflicted by this issue of poverty, right? It, it's, it's, it's the water you're drinking, it's the air you are breathing, it is the food that you have access to, it's the schools that your children attend, it's the transportation assets you have or don't have, it's the way you're policed. All of these things play into how poverty shows itself and how poverty is, is realized amongst populations that have to endure this. And, 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 and to your question, it's also really important to understand that when people say, well, it's not, you know, it's not race, it's poverty. The reality is it's impossible to separate those two things because the data continues to show how completely aligned these two things are, 
right? I mean, that, that, that a, a, a black child who's born to parents in the top income quintile is just as likely to fall into the bottom income quartile in adulthood as they are to stay in the top quintile. And that's compared to, you know, to white, ch white children who are nearly five times as likely to remain in the top quartile. You know, we, we look at the fact that we've invested heavily in higher education and, uh, you know, arguably more than most organizations in the country in the three, our, our three decades long history. But here's the reality is that white employees who drop out of high school have a median net worth that's greater than black and Hispanic employees who have a college degree. Race matters in all of this. And so I think with the, we have to be able to go and think about the solutions, uh, you know, not necessarily, necessarily saying, well, you know, we have to eliminate race from the conversation. No, 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 we have to follow the data. And if the data continues to show us that these discrepancies and these, these disparities still very much exist within our society, uh, our, our job is not to ignore it. Our job is actually to be, you know, to, to be able to take it head on. You know, one, one example, where, uh, you know, oftentimes people talk about things like access to capital and private capital and, and how is capital distributed. And they'll, they'll look immediately to the private markets and say, like, well, if you look at venture capital, you know, less than 10 percent of all venture capital goes to entrepreneurs of color. Right. True fact. Right. And if you, if you disaggregate that and break it down even more, how if you're looking at, you know, black and Latino, et cetera, it breaks down even further. Um, and people in philanthropy pretend like that's not our story too. Like that bias doesn't exist within philanthropy. So we looked at the data and we looked at the data and showed that over the past two decades, there's been a 400% increase in philanthropic giving. Right? During that same time period, less than 10% of all philanthropic dollars went to organizations that were led by people of color. Despite the fact that if you take a look at New York, for example, where Robin Hood is headquartered and Robin Hood does its work, uh, you know, 80% of the population that's living in poverty are people of color in New York. And so to be able to understand, so the, the way we thought about that and address is not simply to say, well, you know, we can't separate these two, we have to separate these two things. But the reality is, is that there is a bias that exists even within philanthropy. And so we actually created something called the Power Fund, which is uh, you know, now, now over, over $16 million fund, where it's a fund that is focused on supporting, finding ways of supporting organizations that are led by people of color and finding ways to support those leaders themselves as well. And because we, we, as we looked at our own work and our own portfolio and the portfolio of philanthropy as a whole, we saw that not only did that discrepancy, that massive discrepancy, not only did it show that there is systemic bias and racism even with our own, our own work, it also showed that it didn't make sense because if we're trying to solve the problem, right? The people who are closest to the challenge are going to be the ones who are closest to the solutions but they're oftentimes not at the table. And so we had to be able to add this lens, add these perspective, add these ideas. And sometimes when people will say, well, you know, it's great that they're now part of the Robin Hood portfolio. My honest answer is our portfolio got better by being able to add these voices and these leaders into the portfolio that we had as a whole. And we, we, we know that that's gonna be a path and a, and, a, and a plan to continue that also as we go forward. So, you know, it, it's it, it's interesting, everything that you're saying is it ties into some, you know, some ideas that I've heard throughout my life. And I want to I want to say some of these ideas and get you to react to them. And so, uh, you know, when the war on poverty, poverty started, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society from that day to today, let's call it 55 or, or so years, about 65 trillion dollars has been spent on poverty programs or safety net oriented programs. Paul Ryan, the former speaker of the house, a Republican said, well, we had a war on poverty and poverty won. That was his reaction. I want you to react to that. And then secondarily, you know, I took a race awareness course, which is one of the more eye-opening courses for me. Cause you know, I, I grew up in this parochial, very patriarchal Italian family uh, you know, we were adjacent to an African-American community and a Irish community, but we were like in a, I would say a pretty sheltered environment. Okay. And when I got to college and I took this race course, the, the racial awareness instructor said to me that if we could eliminate, and again, I'm not saying we can do this, but there's systemic and institutional racism in our society. This was said to me 36 years ago, but he said, if you, if you could just eliminate it, 
the amount of money that's being spent would not ne necessarily be necessary, but it's about eliminating those biases and eliminating those prejudices and preconceptions. So two questions or two statements that I'd like you to react to. War on poverty, poverty won. And did poverty win? Yes or no. And then if it did win, is it because of what I'm saying is there's an institutional racism that we haven't been able to solve for yet? Yeah, um, bo both both really good. And I think both also very, very intertwined, uh, you know, questions. It's, 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 it's impossible to look at where we are right now when it comes to the amount of people who are living in poverty uh, and to think that we have made the kind of dent that we need to make on this issue. Uh, it's also impossible for me to call what we did a war. Uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a very proud soldier and paratrooper. I served in Afghanistan with the 82nd Airborne Division. And if there's something that I learned about war while I was deployed, it was that there were no tools that we would not use when it came to winning in battle, right? Is that we believe in overwhelming force. That if you were going after a squad, you brought a platoon. If you're going after a platoon, you brought a company. We believe in overwhelming force because we believe in winning battles. There has been an amazingly uneven approach in the way we've adjusted when it came to poverty in this country. And this is over the duration of the time when it comes to ever since the war on poverty was first kicked off. This is not about, a, you know, not about an administration or a specific leader. It's about the fact that we have been amazingly miserly when it came to addressing the very human pain that many people feel. Uh, and going back to the, to the, to the second point, uh, it, it's, it's also impossible to look at how color-coded these type of disparities are still, you know, in the case of what's happening in so many of our, you know, so many of our areas. And, you know, we know poverty exists in rural America, urban America, suburban America. We know poverty, uh, that rural poverty can be, at times be just as complicated and just as nefarious as urban poverty and, and a whole bunch of other areas in which we see it. But the reality is, is that we are still living in dynamics and still living in, with a focus where you take New York City for, for just one example, you know, 23% of, of, of all black New Yorkers are living in poverty, right? Compared to 13% of New Yorkers, period. That discrepancy, that disparity has to be understood. And, and, and to the point, to your question, we also have to understand history. We have to understand policies that were put in place that were putting people and keeping people in poverty. We can't talk about the fact that we have a 10 to one racial wealth gap in this country, which is what we have right now, 10 to one. That's not because one family worked 10 times harder than another family. It's because we still had systemic barriers that your professor was talking about. We still have to deal and contend with the history of things like redlining and the history of things like discriminatory housing policies, discriminatory lending policies, discriminatory transportation lines and transportation policies that were put in place. These are things that, that, that require a certain measure of honesty, honesty for all of us to understand that even when you're looking at the origins and the founding of the country, that so much of these things were built on this. And so the only way for us to be able to attack it is to be deliberate in order to attack it, that, that being able to come up with you know, race neutral policies in an area when the discrepancies are in no way race neutral is never going to be able to get us to that point, to that aspect where we are talking about opportunities for all. And we're talking about equity and, and equality in a way that all of us believe in, but we just want to see happen. And so I think that, uh, that there, has been, there has been progress on a lot of fronts. There have been things that have been done that have been important when it comes to helping to, to alleviate the pain of poverty for people. But frankly, I'm not interested in poverty alleviation. I'm not interested in making poverty easier on people. I'm interested in moving people out of it. I'm interested in moving people out of it permanently. And when it comes to the type of impact that we hopefully could have made at that point, we have not made the kind of progress that I think the beauty of, uh, of, of, of the, the origin, originating documents and words of this country that they actually correlate to. Wes, I want to jump in with a question about your most recent book, uh, which is called Five Days, The Fiery Reckoning of an American City. It's about Baltimore, the city you grew up in, in the aftermath of the murder of Freddie Gray. 
Um, and you talk about a lot of different issues, including uh, policing, which is a, a very big problem in Baltimore, uh, as well as many other cities around the country. But what did you learn over the course of writing that book? And what did you hope the audience uh, took away after you were able to do all the research that went into it? Yeah, you know, it's, um, it, it, was, it was really interesting because I think when I think about the origin story of, of that, it was, it was me actually sitting there at Freddie's funeral. Um, and I realized, and I thought about it, I said, this is the first funeral that I've ever attended of someone who I did not know while they were living. And I was like, I think that's part of the problem is that I think there's a certain measure of complicity that I felt like there's a weight of complicity in that. And I literally did not even, I sat in the back and I didn't even go up to the casket because I didn't feel like I earned that walk. I didn't earn it. And and really going back into it, because so much of the conversation was about what happened to him, why we had a 25-year-old man, young man, laying in a casket in West Baltimore, right? What happened when he interacted with police, the fact that he made eye contact with police. And by the way, that was his crime. And it's a crime because in certain neighborhoods, generally what they consider high poverty areas, high crime neighborhoods, making eye contact with police and running is enough to justify probable cause. That happened because he had happened because he made eye contact with police in Harlem Park and in Sandtown, Winchester. Had he been a mile away and he'd done it in Guilford or Roland Park and you make eye contact with police and you run, you're going for a jog. There's no crime, but it happened in Sandtown, Winchester. He ran, he was arrested. An hour after he was arrested, he was in a coma. A week after he was placed in a coma, he died. And so much of the conversation was around his death, what happened to him. And that was a really important conversation that we had to have because there, had, there needed to be justice for that. How does a person make eye contact with police and an hour later they're in a coma? But it also, it helped, it, it really begged me to think through the idea of we can't just spend all the time mourning his death. We also have to mourn his life. We have to mourn the fact that, you know, in the city of Baltimore, my hometown, where I live now, my hometown of Baltimore, 29% of families with children are living in poverty. 29% of families with children are living in poverty in Baltimore right now. We have to mourn the fact that when you think about Freddie Gray, where, uh, where you know, the Freddie Gray was born premature and underweight. He was born uh, exposed to heroin because his mother uh, battled addiction for much of her life. His mother lived in deep poverty her entire life. His mother never made it to high school. She could not read nor write. Freddie Gray, once he finally gained enough weight after he was born, him and his twin sister were moved into a housing project in West Baltimore, um, where, and, and it was in 2009, that that and also 480 other homes were cited in a civil lawsuit because of the endemic levels of lead that existed inside of that home. The CDC indicates that if a person has any exposure to lead, it's problematic. But if a person has over anywhere over five micrograms of blood in every deci of, of lead in every deciliter of blood, that that person will have cognitive damage for the remainder of their life. Freddie Gray had 36. So this was a young man who was born underweight, wow. premature, exposed to heroin, born into deep poverty, and lead poisoned. And by that time in his life, He's two years old. So we can't just spend the time mourning his death. If we're not also willing to spend the time to mourn his life and to understand that his story is far too common for so many kids. And then we look at the realities of what happens as we're watching our young people come up into adolescence and come up into adulthood. And then they are blamed or their poverty without understanding that for so many of our children, they are getting their destiny handed to them before they even have a chance to have a say. And that is so fundamentally unfair. And so that was really the thing that I wanted people to understand with this book is, is take a look at these five days in Baltimore through the eyes of these eight people, all eight very different and fascinating characters and you know, individuals in their own way who all had their own journey to get to that point, to that five days and how they both responded to this crisis. But also let's never forget about the young man that brought them all together. 
And that young man was Freddie Gray. And it goes back to your answer about the cycle of poverty and it's sort of all the above in terms of how we break it. Uh, you have to put people in a better environment and nurture them all the way up to the point where they can you know, become fully employed and, and have their dignity uh, as, a, as a functioning member of society. I wanna ask you about the COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously that has disproportionately affected people of color, uh, both in terms of the mortality rate, as well as the economic impact of COVID-19. So as an organization, how are you specifically pivoting or taking part of your mission and addressing issues that have been, uh, that have arisen as a result of the pandemic specifically? Yeah, I mean, th this, this pandemic has rocked. Uh, not just New York City, it's areas around the, around the, around the, the, the country and the globe. But you know, if you're looking at what, what has happened within so many of our communities, uh, they, you know, we saw how the disparities existed before COVID-19 and how in many ways due to COVID-19, you've just watched not just a, an illustration, but also a complete exacerbation of what we were seeing and what was going on. Um, you know, we, we looked at the fact that there were so many people who were essentially being left out of any forms of support. You know, frankly, we saw how slow the support came from the federal government, how slow the support came from state governments, how slow the support came from local governments. And we knew that we actually had to alter the way that we thought about our supports, both in terms of leveraging public policy change, but then also how are we targeting the capital to move quickly out to the communities and to the individuals and the families that needed it most. And so we ended up, uh, we ended up launching, relaunching our relief fund it's only the third time in the organization's history that we launched a relief fund. The first was after 9-11. The second was after Hurricane Sandy. And the third now was COVID-19. And we realized very early that COVID-19 was going to be different even from the other ones because the tail was so long of the damage and the destruction that we continue to see within the city, particularly for the communities that we serve. And so there were a couple big focus areas that we wanted to put for our relief fund. One is how are we thinking about the basic elements of the rebuilding and the supporting of the social service sector? You know, oftentimes people think about social service like, oh yeah, government does this, government does that. Government doesn't do that, they fund that, right? But when we're talking about everything from after school programs to food programs to, to educational support programs, it's not like the government's creating them. It's the government that's funding the organizations on the ground who's doing the work. And so really coming up and helping to propel these organizations who at that time were needed then to do the work more than ever before. The second piece that really became very important to us was just this basic idea of emergency cash assistance. Um, you know, we, we do a partnership with Columbia University called the Poverty Tracker. And something that we saw right before COVID-19 was that a staggering 50% of all adults in New York City experienced poverty for at least a year over the past four years. Not 50% of a borough, not 50% of a demographic, 50% of the city. And so we knew that if you had a situation where, you know, more than 40% of all people in the country could not afford a $400 shot with cash, that shot came and it was a lot more than $400. And so we actually started using a, 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 you know, a significant portion of the capital from the relief fund to just doing basic things like emergency cash assistance. Right. Do you cash believe in do you believe in a federal UBI universal basic income type of program to alleviate poverty, or are there other things that you think would be more efficient in addressing that? Well, I, I think I think we need to be targeted in the way that we are thinking about our capital allocation. You know, for example, when we you know if you just take a look at how we how we did it, I think it's very reflective of a way where we have we were very targeted. Um, you know, the people who we supported were people who oftentimes were being left out of the conversation. Uh, you know, we have, you know, for example, we supported, uh, you know, we supported individuals who were undocumented. Um, and because even when you look at things like the CARES Act that was passed, the CARES Act, people say, well, wasn't there a cash assistance element to the CARES Act? Yeah, there was a cash assistance element. But right. if you were undocumented, there was no cash assistance for you. If you were part of a mixed status household, there was no cash assistance that came out of that. If you were working, but not making enough money to hit the, the income tax filing threshold, there was no cash assistance for you. And so we had a support system that was leaving millions of people out. And so we thought then with our capital, what we wanted to do was really come up with targeted ways of being able to support those who found themselves in the most vulnerable situations at that time and give them measures of support that they were not getting from government and they were not getting, getting from other elements. 
you know, that we just have now announced a, a partnership with Morgan Stanley around around dealing with, uh, with with street vendors. And you know, the majority of street vendors are immigrants, many of whom are undocumented, many of whom are you know, they, and they're street vendors, so they're working and they're paying taxes, but they're not in recipients of any forms of of, of any for other types of benefits. Right. They are oftentimes the ones who are the main breadwinners within their families. And so working with Morgan Stanley, creating this platform around this issue became something that was important, not just because we wanted to get cash out, but because of, you know, to your point, uh, we had to make it targeted because we knew who the people were that were getting hit the hardest, and we had to come up with and find ways to support them. So the last question that we want to ask you is, how can people help, both in terms of supporting Robinhood directly with financial contributions and also non-financial contributions? If somebody wanted to help address your mission at Robin Hood uh, without maybe if they don't have money or if they want to, if they don't have a lot of money to contribute to a, a financial cause, how can they help your mission as well? Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a, there's a, a few really important ways. You know, one is these organizations that, uh, that, that we support, they, they need financial support, but they need a whole lot more than that. Oftentimes they will need board members. They'll need people to assist them with legal or accounting. And so if you have an expertise that could actually help an organization be able to grow and thrive and scale. Uh, that kind of support can oftentimes be just as useful and helpful as an individual who is looking for, for, for development and capital donations. The second big piece, though, is get involved in policymaking. The reason that we have the kind of holes that we have is oftentimes it's because people are falling through cracks because there are holes in policy. I think about an issue that we're working on right now, dealing with the child tax credit and how do we make the child tax credit not just fully refundable, but how do you make that permanent? And the child tax credit, you know, just for, for, for those who know, it's, you know it, it, it was really created to better support children, particularly children in the most vulnerable situations and support their families. Uh, and it has been an incredible tool to mitigate child poverty, um, but it has its, 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 has its, its the pitfalls. And if you look at where we are right now, and part of the pitfalls is that it doesn't make it fully, if it, without making it fully refundable, we're still gonna have a situation where 24 million children do not qualify for the child tax, child tax credit. And for this reason, it's because they're too deep into poverty. So we have an anti-poverty program that's leaving 24 million children out because they're too deep into poverty. If we can, if people can use their voice and people can use their advocacy and people can use their influence to be able to work on creating smart policy, that this is not just about moral or just leadership, it's smart policy. As a nation, we are hemorrhaging human potential at an unprecedented rate. The cost of child poverty in this country right now, every single year, hovers between $700 billion and $1.1 trillion. That's the cost. This is not a no cost equation. That's the cost. And so right. how we think about that and change that and people can use their influence to be able to support that is something that would be huge for an organization like ours because what you'd fundamentally be doing is changing the landscape. Well, Wes, thank you so much for joining us. We love shining a light on these types of causes. You are one of the most dynamic organizations in terms of your fundraising and the different support you provide across a whole suite of, of different issues that are facing not just minority communities, but uh, anybody facing poverty or, or the fear of poverty. So thank you much. Thank you so much for everything that you have done and continue to do. Anthony, you have a final word uh, for Wes before we let him go. Well, you know what I what I love about I love so many things about what you're doing, Wes, but I love the fact that you're in the empowerment movement and you're in the decentralizing movement to impress upon people that they can take control of their own lives and lift themselves up in various ways. And just laying out the tools and helping them to use your own words back is less paternalistic. And I totally get that. And I think it's absolutely brilliant. So I tip my hat to you. Although since I have a full head of hair more, I don't have to wear a hat, okay? I'll, I'll leave the hat wearing to you, okay? But I do. Tip, if I did have a hat, I would tip my hat to you, Wes. I appreciate it. You've done an amazing job. And hopefully we can get you to one of our uh, in-person conferences when those are able to resume. Uh, we'll have an announcement on our next in-person conference here in the next few weeks. Uh, and I'll, I'll give people a little bit of a hint. We typically have our conference in Las Vegas, but we're bringing it home to our home city 
of New York uh, in an effort to help spur the revitalization of that city and hopefully help uh, your mission as well over at Robin Hood West. So thank you. And we look to see you soon at one of our in-person conferences. I look forward to it. Appreciate y'all. Thank you so much. Great. And thank you, everybody who tuned in to today's SALT Talk uh, with Wes Moore, the CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation, a tremendous organization that's done so much for the city of New York and continues to set an example for how we can uh, alleviate poverty, like Anthony mentioned, by empowering people uh, long term. So thank you so much for joining us. And please visit the Robin Hood Foundation website uh, if you want to make a financial contribution. And as Wes said, there's plenty of other ways, non-financial uh, to make a contribution to that organization and the organization that Robin Hood uh, supports as well. Just a reminder, if you missed any part of this talk or any of our previous SALT talks, our entire archive is on our website at salt.org backslash talks backslash archive. And if you wanna watch these episodes live, you can sign up to get notifications to join us uh, by going to salt.org backslash talks. Please spread the word about SALT talks. We love growing our community, our YouTube channel and our viewership has grown tremendously, uh, especially during the pandemic, as everybody's at home on Zoom and on YouTube and all these other digital outlets. So please spread the word. We're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on uh, Facebook, and we're on LinkedIn. So please follow us there as well and help us amplify uh, what we think are really meaningful conversations across a variety of very important topics. But on behalf of the entire SALT team, this is John Darcy uh, signing off for today. We'll see you back here again soon on SALT Talks.